Kayla um, from Book Passages, MB14, sitting down with Sarah. Come on, you can do it! Sarah <laughs> Milnowski. Perfect. <clears throat> Sarah with the Polish W. Um, <laughs> talking about her most, or talking about her latest book. Don't even think about it. Um, so, just going to ask a couple questions. Have a great conversation about books because those are really the best conversations, aren't they? Uh, so, Sarah, could you tell us a little bit about the book that made you fall in love with reading, or that inspired you to become a writer? Um, my, the first books that I fell madly in love with and made me want to become a writer were books by Judy Bloom. Pretty much anything by Judy Bloom I loved. They were just so funny, and they really talked about the experience of being a woman, uh, or being a girl, and I just loved reading them. I also loved reading thrillers like Christopher Pike and Lois Duncan when I was younger. Um, I remember the first, actually the first first book I ever read was um, Ramona and Her Father by Beverly Cleary. Clearly. And um, when I got to page 100, I remember being so thrilled that I had gotten to page 100 that I was jumping up and cheering. I thought they should put little balloons and hearts and confetti <laughs> on page 100 in the book. Um, and I, I, so I always ask my publisher, maybe one day on page 100 we could have like, sparkles pop out. Um, I also, I loved all books by Gordon Corman. Um, and uh, This Can't Be Happening with Donald Hall was one of my favorite books that I read when I was a kid. And uh, when I was in the fourth grade, he came to talk to my class. And uh, I remember being so amazed and impressed and thinking that, okay, I want to be, you know, just like him when I'm older, I want to be a writer. And he actually wrote his first book at age 12. So he was, only like, like he was only like 15 or something when he came to talk to my, talk to my class. So it was really, it was, uh, it, it was very inspiring. Uh, was there anything in particular that inspired you to write Don't Even Think About, any moment or, yeah, what was the inspiration for, for this particular Well, book? I was walking in Tribeca, that's the area of New York that I live in, and there was this huge building that had no windows. And I thought it was so creepy, okay, because why would a building have no windows? It makes no sense, right? Like, what possible reason could it have no windows? Nothing good. No, nothing. nothing exactly. Good. That's exactly what I thought. And I thought maybe like a room full of trampolines, but that's <laughs> mentioned. Um, the prose flows incredibly smoothly and don't even think about it. Um, and we were wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that process, about your writing process of the book. Well, when I write first drafts, first I usually have some sort of outline. I'll come up with a concept and then I'll write a little bit of an outline. For this book, I didn't have such an intense outline. I maybe had, um, you know, two pages of where I thought the book would go. And then what I do is I just sit down and write pretty much the entire book out in dialogue. I mean, it's not that it has to be specifically dialogue, but I just my goal is to just get it all out, get the story out there. So I end up with um, maybe you know 100, 100, 150 pages of dialogue and scenes, ideas, and that's kind of how I brainstorm what is actually going to happen in, in the book. And then once that is all out, then I go back and recraft certain scenes. I move. I'll see that I'll see dialogue that I like, but the background that I had in isn't interesting enough, and I'll move it somewhere else. Okay. <laughs> um, and don't even think about it, you also deal with a really wide cast of characters that all get held together really well in the story. Can you maybe talk a little bit about managing and dealing with so many characters, especially since so many other YA novels kind of limit their, their <laughs> cast? I, there are a lot of characters. Well, the book is about a, you know, a homeroom class who all get ESP or, uh, or telepathy from a uh, flu shot. From, different, from their flu shots, and I, I really wanted to have a the entire homeroom class, so that was really important to me when I started. Um, what I did is I, when I first first started, the original original draft only had one point of view and one main character. It was all going to be told from Olivia's perspective, and I wrote about three chapters like that, and there just wasn't anything I felt interesting enough about that. I needed to, to shake it up and do something different. So then I had the idea to do it from first person plural and to tell all their stories. So then I actually started to tell all 22 of their stories. And it was, there were too many stories. I felt I couldn't jump back and forth between you know, that many characters. So I decided instead 
that I was going to, while you know, giving you little bits and hints of all the different characters, I was really only going to focus on you know, four or five characters. And that's how I limited it in some way. So that even though you get a taste of all the characters, you're really only um, getting going into detail into a few of them. So hopefully you're better able to connect with, the, with some of the main characters. So even if you forget who a few of the secondary characters are, get, or it's not as important as focusing on the group as a whole. Um, and kind of, you know, when you're writing, what is that writing process like? You know, do you set aside time in the morning? What's, how do you kind of go about getting the story out there? Um, I write, uh, I write full time, uh, so I write usually from about 9 to 6, although really it's more like 10 to 6. But okay. I have an interesting, I have an interesting setup in that, um, I, so I live in, in Manhattan in an apartment and I have, in my building I actually have a lounge, there's like a work lounge for residents to use. So I go down to the lounge, um, probably about three, four times a week, and I invite other writer friends over to come keep me company, if I can't write all by myself all day, I'll go crazy. And I have other writers there, and we keep each other company, and we write. Um, and I put everyone on a crazy schedule, okay? I'm very strict about my, about my techniques, and I, I say 15 minutes, okay, one five on, of actual focusing on your novel writing, and then 15 minutes off. And so during the 15 minutes on, you can only work on your book, okay? There's nothing else open, you can't talk, nothing else, no bathroom breaks, nothing. 15 <laughs> minutes on. And then 15 minutes off, you could, we could chat, you can do plot points, you could email, you could tweet, uh, you can go get food, you can do whatever you want. Or you can, of course, keep working if you're on roll, um, but, but uh, that you can only do other things during those 15 minutes. Uh, who are some of your favorite writing friends to, to write over? Um, Robin Wasserman comes off in, Courtney Scheinel comes off in, Elizabeth Yulberg comes, uh, Jess Rothenberg. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, who, uh, E. Lockhart comes also, I'm sure I'm forgetting someone right now that comes. Different people when they're in town, they come visit also, so I, I'm always open to, to other YA writers who want to come hang out. Alright, so now, jumping back, you know, a few years, or um, your first book, how did you first kind of go about getting that first book out there, kind of entering the world of being a YA author? Oh, for, well, I didn't start with YA. I actually started writing Chicklet, and all Chicklet. My story, um, it's a, it's a bit different. What happened was, when I graduated from college, I studied English lit in college, and I knew I wanted to write, but I felt that I needed a real job. I couldn't just become a writer. So what I did was I, I um, did various internships at, at different publishing houses. Um, I interned at the Tandon and Whiteside. I, I grew up in Montreal also, so then um, I, I worked at different Canadian stores. And then I um, moved to Toronto, and I took publishing courses, and I got a job at Mabel's Fables, a children's independent bookstore in Toronto. And um, eventually, I got a job at Harlequin Enterprises, the romance publisher, with the raven hair and um, and Fabio <laughs> and all this. So I got a job. I got a job there in the marketing department. And while I was there, um, they were they decided they were going to launch a new line of novels, chiclet novels. It was a series called Red Dress Inc. Um, and they uh, and and they were looking for writers. They did not have twenty something writers. At the time, um, a lot of the, the Harlequin writers, I guess, were older. They were looking for a very specific young writer or writers to write these chiclet type books. Um, and I felt this was my opportunity. I wanted to do it, and I just started writing my book. I started. I would go on bad dates and write them out. Um, pretty much, I would, you know, I would honestly use lip liner on napkins when I was out with my friends uh, for drinks. And then I, I, I sold that first book. Um, and I sold the next one to them too, and then I, I, I wrote novels until I could afford, and I continued my job until I could afford to quit my job and write full time. And as soon as I became a full time writer, I decided I wanted to write my YA novel because I knew I always wanted to write, um, write not YA books, and I, uh, I wrote Browns and Broomsticks. So, what drew you to YA? Why, yeah, what compelled you to kind of? approach that genre? I always knew that's what I wanted to do. I mean, even when I was in college, I would always I would always be the one um, in creative writing classes writing like, a YA story. That was always what I did. Um, I kind of fell into the chick but my heart was always in, yeah, in children's fiction. YA fiction, middle grade fiction, that's always what I wanted to do. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so, what has been kind of one of your favorite memories that was brought about through this whole, you know, being a full-time writer job opportunity? What's, has anything really stuck out for you or, yeah, been particularly memorable through this whole process? About being a writer? Yeah, being a writer, you know, something that, something that happened because of your job as a writer. 
if that makes sense. Um, how can I help it? I mean, I love, I love my life. I feel, you know, I feel um, thrilled to be able to do it every day. I feel lucky every day to be able to write books all the time. I get to, you know, talk, go to schools. I get to come to bookstores. To me, spending time in bookstores is what I do on vacation. So the fact that I get to do this as work is amazing. Um, often I get to go, you know, travel and um, with, with some of my best friends. Um, who are writers? I, was, uh, I, I, write, I wrote a book with E. Lockhart and with Lauren Meyer called, called How to Be Bad, and they sent us on like a three or four week tour. So we had an all expense, these are two of my closest friends, we had an all expense paid vacation <laughs> that was work, but you know, not really. Going to bookstores for us and talking about writing and meeting readers is, is amazing. So you know, it never feels like work. Um, okay, so you mentioned earlier that you know something kind of in this kind of a setting of talking to people at a bookstore is familiar, but live television was one of the scariest things. Yeah, <laughs> can you elaborate on that experience? I just I find talking um, on television very scary, <laughs> very scary, <laughs> especially when you know when it's live. Because I feel like at any moment I can do something crazy. <laughs> Okay, I haven't done anything yet, but, um, but at any moment things could happen. And also, um, I guess when I was younger, I had a lot of stage fright. Uh, there was once when I was in a, um, a camp, I went to a sleepaway camp, but I was in a camp play, and I, um, I, I was just, I had one line, and I remember getting on stage, and, and I just had that one line that I had practiced over and over and over again. Yet when I got on stage, all I did was this. <laughs> I had no idea what I was supposed to say. Um, and I just stood there forever, and I wished that someone would like, you know, the stage would open up and I would fall through or something, but, but eventually they just continued with the scene. Um, but I decided I would never be in a play again. <laughs> and live television for me feels very much like that. Um, so uh, what are some of your experiences that, it, or where have you been on live television or, you know, discussing what books kind of? Um, I was on the BBC once uh, for my first book, Milk Run, and I've uh, done some news programs, like a, you know, thing on tour, I've done some, I guess global news stuff and, and over the years. <laughs> um, so as you can see, we have a rather large yes. poster of your Don't book. Don't even think about it. Yeah, <laughs> that's my new book. I'm excited. Um, so just out of curiosity, how much input do authors usually have when it comes to the cover of their book? Um, authors, it depends on the author. I usually don't have that much say. Uh, in my contract, I have um, cover, what is it? It's not cover approval, it's cover what it is, cover, not approval. I get, I get, I'm shown the cover and asked what I think, um, but usually it's, it's not really up to me. Um, like for instance, when I got this cover at first, it was, it, it was white in the background, and I didn't love the white in the background, so we talked about what else we could do, and, and my editor came up with the idea of these stripes, which I loved the stripes. I just thought they were so much fun. So I, my, they definitely value my opinion, but ultimately it's not up, it's not up to me. Or I can think. <laughs> Um, are there any, hmm. <laughs> um, do you have any advice for, you know, any other teens or anyone who's interested in becoming a writer, pursuing a career in YA? Um, I mean, I would, my advice to aspiring writers would be to read everything, um, just read all the time, write one page a day if they can, because, you know, break it up. The idea of sitting down and writing an entire novel is very overwhelming, but instead, if you focus on writing one page a day, or um, or just, you know, one chapter a week or something much smaller, then it's much more manageable and not as overwhelming. That's what I would recommend. And by reading everything, it's because you don't really know, um, you know, you don't really know the type of book that you, that you want to write until you know you've read so many things and see what appeals to you as a reader. Uh, for me, I like to write the kind of books that I um, like to read. So that way when I'm writing, I can always see myself as the, as the target reader. Um, anything else you want to share? Any, any? Um, thank you for having me. I'm <laughs> excited to talk about the book. And it was fun to write, and I hope it'll be fun for you. Well, thank you so much for sitting down with us and chatting. Um, hopefully, we'll see you again in the future at some point. I would love to come back. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you.